Hi everyone, welcome to my kitchen. I'm doing some home brewing. We actually pressed some apples from the co-op and we mixed in some crab apples from our tree outside. Um, it's actually literally so heavy with crab apples that it's hitting the roof and the, the windows. So we decided to make some hard cider out of those. So what I did was I added um, yeast to a starter culture and then eventually I added the um, starter culture to the larger batch of pressed apple juice and I added some cherry juice and um, we're, we're off to the races to do some brewing. So you might not be surprised that brewing has been the, the source of a lot of philosophical disagreement among scientists over many years. And in fact, it was the mid 19th century when a very famous scientist named Louis Pasteur, you'll recognize that name, was um, in a bit of a good natured philosophical debate with another scientist, his name was Justice Liebig, and they kind of took two different schools of thoughts to this idea of how yeast took the sugar and converted it into alcohol. And really Louis Pasteur was a vitalist. He was arguing that in fact the entire yeast cell, the entire organism, kind of an organismal level kind of argument, he was saying that the whole cell system was needed to brew the alcohol from the sugar. Justice Liebig was taking a little bit more of a mechanistic approach, and he was arguing that really it was a set of chemical reactions um, that were was occurring within the yeast, and maybe the yeast themselves were not required. Um, truthfully, there's both a mechanistic and a vitalistic approach that's important. And in fact, you just saw that explode, which is a perfect demonstration um, of the chemical reactions that are going on in there. So absolutely, Justice Liebig was right that there were there are there there are core chemical reactions in there occurring that allow for the brewing. But one might also argue that, man, I think this is going to be a heck of a lot better made with the full cellular yeast than it would be if we just added chemicals in there to allow the conversion of sugar to alcohol. So I think you could say that both mechanists and vitalists were a little bit right. But here's the cool part. Turns out that the name enzyme actually literally means in yeast. So enzymes are the simple catalysts that convert sugar to alcohol in yeast enzymes. What about enzymes? What do they do? Enzymes are simple catalysts. They act as simple catalysts in the cell and they do so by speeding the reaction rate. They decrease the amount of energy that's needed for reaction reactants to con be converted into products. When a reactant is converted into a product, it generally goes through a very awkward sort of phase in the middle. We call it a transition state and enzymes lower the reaction activation energy by stabilizing that awkward molecule. But here's what's really cool about enzymes is that they do what they do in really mild conditions. Now contrast to this to the benchtop chemistry that you might have done in the past. Remember that in order to get a chemical reaction to proceed with a chemical catalyst, sometimes what we do is we add, we have extreme conditions. I've used a picture of Norris Geyser Basin here sort of as a, um, a metaphor for the kinds of conditions that we need to allow chemical catalysis. At Norris Geyser Basin, the temperature is very, very hot and the pH is very, very low. So these are the types of extreme conditions that are needed in order to allow chemical catalysis. However, in um, biological systems, enzymes do this at a very gentle sort of biological state. They do so at, at really nearly neutral pH and at physiological temperatures. So the conditions required for enzyme, enzymatic catalysis are very, very mild conditions. Now, what do enzymes bind to? What are the reactants of these reactions? We call them substrates, and enzymes are really quite picky about their substrates. Um, they like to bind to one specific substrate or a group of very highly related substrates. So the next time you're looking for a good pickup line, you can say, um, if I were an enzyme, I'd want you to be my one specific substrate um, because it really means something, right? It is that particular substrate that is recognized. Now, that 
that being said, um, just like people, enzymes vary. There are some enzymes that are super, super specific. Like they're so specific that they show stereospecificity. They only bind to the L in antimer and not the D in antimer. But then there are some enzymes that are much more promiscuous. Digestive enzymes are a good example. And these promiscuous enzymes, mm, they bind to quite a bit more in the way of substrates. Now, Enzymes are phenomenal in terms of the purity of their products. Now, if you've done benchtop chemistry, you know that whenever you do that, there's always unspecific, quote, byproducts of the reaction. Um, the idea of getting nearly 100% purity of products is pretty outlandish in the world of benchtop chemistry. Um, so enzymes, they do it. They pull it off. They are able to do, uh, they are able to catalyze reactions that lead to essentially 100% purity in the products. Wow. This makes you think about the field of biomimicry. And if we could do a good job of doing what enzymes do, think about how much we could improve the efficiency of our processes of energy generation. Enzymes couple reactions. That is to say, if you have a reaction that is exergonic, that can be coupled to an endergonic reaction to let it go. So said another way, if we have a molecule of glucose that is needs to get converted into glucose 6-phosphate, that's an, that's an energy requiring process. It requires energy investment. So hey, why not couple it to the hydrolysis of ATP? ATP can be broken down to power the formation of glucose 6-phosphate. It's also the source of the phosphoryl group. The enzyme that does this is called hexokinase, and hexokinase is really a phenomenal enzyme with respect to the way that it binds its substrate. So when it binds to ATP and glucose, hexokinase literally wraps around conforming to those sub substrates. That is one um, way in which an enzyme fits its substrate. And it took us a while to understand how enzymes fit their substrates. For a long time, we um, held to the notions that ML Fisher had proposed this idea of a lock and key. That is, the, the substrate would be like the key and the lock would be like the enzyme. And this just was this perfect fit, right? Very hard and rigid kind of fit. But in fact, we now know that more enzymes utilize at least uh, a portion of induced fit. So this was uh, proposed by D. E. Koshland in 1958. And this is the idea that, um, like hexokinase, that enzymes literally wrap around their substrates. They conform to them. Kind of like when you get a brand new pair of super sleek racing Nordic ski gloves and you put your hand in them and it kind of conforms to your hand. It feels so good. All right, that's the more likely the mechanism that um, we are seeing with most enzymes. So what else about enzymes? Well, they increase reaction rates a lot by 10 to the third to 10 to the 20th fold, but they don't change the reaction equilibrium. That is, they're not making an unfavorable reaction into a favorable reaction. Um, but most enzyme catalyzed reactions wouldn't occur without them. Um, even the simple hydration of CO2, which is done by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, without the enzyme wouldn't, wouldn't occur to any appreciable extent. And yet with the enzyme, that increases the reaction rate by 10 to the seventh. So an immense amount of increase in the rate. Enzymes are often named by adding ACE to the end of the name. Um, for example, if we have an enzyme that breaks down proteins, protease. If we have an enzyme that breaks, breaks down lipids, lipase. Um, pretty sensical naming. Enzymes often serve, serve as points of regulation in metabolic pathways. When we start with a molecule, then an enzyme works on it, makes an intermediate, then another enzyme works on it, makes another intermediate. But say that the product of all of this metabolic action is not needed, why then maybe enzyme one gets inhibited. So then that regulates the entire pathway. And that is an elegant way that we're going to see in biological systems is utilized regularly. So let's look back in yeast at one of the enzymes that's making the conversion of sugar to alcohol possible. This enzyme is called alcohol dehydrogenase, or ADH for short. Um, it is the number you can get it on Protein Data Bank is 4W6Z. So you'll see here alcohol dehydrogenase and recognize the um, cofactor at the active site there. There's the active cleft 
shift of the enzyme. This particular enzyme is responsible for converting acetaldehyde into alcohol in the final step of fermentation. This is an essential step um, and a big part of what allows yeast to keep on living in that anaerobic environment. So remember last night when I showed you the brewing apparatus, I was putting an airlock in the top. That airlock enables CO2 to bubble out from the fermentation um, and it, it, it disables oxygen from entering in so that the yeast have to live fermentatively. They have to take advantage of their alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. Now, here's the cool thing. We also have an isozyme of alcohol dehydrogenase in our liver and you guessed it, it, it actually does catalyze the reverse reaction so that when you've had a little bit too much wine or beer or whatever your choice is and your liver is in action detoxifying that molecule, it's converting ethanol backwards to acetaldehyde, which can then eventually get converted to acetate and enter into metabolism. So you, the next time you uh, are trying to pray to the porcelain goddess, really what you should be uh, thinking is your alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. So enzymes in yeast.